All right, we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah Fellow, and I am so excited to be hosting Dr. Makita Brotman today. I'm sorry we're a few minutes late, but I have solved the mystery of where she was and found her, and we're so excited to welcome her on her pub day and take all of your pressing questions. So if you've been here before, you know how it works, and if you're new, welcome. We're so excited to have you. Here's how it works. Every week, I present you with hand-picked featured authors, and you get to ask them anything. So feel free to ask Makita about her book, Couple, Couple Found Slain. Ask her about her teaching work in this area. Ask her about her writing process. Ask her anything that you are wondering. Get your questions going in the comments, and I'll get them right over to her. Now, while you're thinking, Makita, welcome. Tell us about your book. Thank you. Well, um Couple Found Slain is a it's it's kind of different from most crime true crime books. I think I would describe it as a true crime book, but it takes a very different approach to true crime than most true crime books, in that it's not so much about the crime itself, it's about what happens after the crime. So Couple Found Slain is about, as you can probably guess, a couple who were found slain. And the couple were the parents of um a young man who was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. His name is Brian Bechtel. And um, he, parasite killing of one's parents is actually used to be known as the schizophrenic crime. It's, it's pretty, I wouldn't say common, but among schizophrenics who commit crimes, it's one of the most common. So, um, so Brian committed this crime in 2002 and he immediately, or went on the run, but within a week had confessed to the police and turned himself in, admitted to his crime. And, you know, there was no question that he committed it. And there was no question that he was mentally ill. He was, um, he was judged not competent to stand trial. And, and so the story really begins when he's um, admitted to a psychiatric hospital, a forensic psychiatric hospital, where he actually still remains today, 27 years later. So it's really a story about that, about, I mean, one imagines that in a psychiatric hospital, not a lot happens, but in fact, Brian's had a really fascinating life. All kinds of things has happened to him while he's been in there, apart from the you know, things you might imagine, like the confusion about medications and different psychiatrists, he's witnessed patient on patient murders he's had a psychiatrist who was found criminally insane he's escaped from being shot by police and returned to the hospital he's got cancer and recovered from that he defended himself in a number of uh, trials to, to be released from the hospital and so i really wanted to to write about um this story from a very different point of view um most true crime is really you know it, it it follows the point of view of the prosecution. It kind of ends with the murderer being found and tried and sent to prison or um, or executed perhaps, or sent to a psychiatric hospital. And I really wanted to write a book about what happens after that, because even though it's the end of the story in, in some ways, it's the beginning of the story for, you know, for in, in other ways too. So I think it's important that that, that, that gets told. Wow. Well, first of all, so much to talk about here, because as you said, most true crimes end with wanting to solve this mystery, wanting to find the killer, find the perpetrator, get justice for the victims. And for most of us, I know I rarely have thought about what happens after that. I'm so focused on 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 that mystery and getting to the bottom of it and unraveling it that I never really thought about well, what does happen to the perpetrator? What does happen to that person? And so what I found, and you address that actually in the opening of your book, in the introduction of your book, and you say that actually the rest of the story, quote, dense and messy lies beneath. And I, I loved that because it is both dense and messy. Um, and, and you start by not with Brian, the perpetrator, the shooter, the self-confessed uh, perpetrator of this crime, but with his parents and actually his grandparents' story, setting the stage and looking at this as really a full 
bodied, multi-generational, what are all the impacts, what are all the threads on this person's life, which I thought was very fascinating. And you as a psychologist, um, that makes sense for you to, for, to do. So let's start with why this story? Why this guy? Because um, you've worked with this guy. But first, actually, I just want to—I want to welcome everybody who's watching on Facebook and on YouTube. Hi, Gail. She's saying hi, hi, Sarah and Makita. Gail, top community member there. Welcome, Gail. So happy to have you. Thanks for joining us today. Anise is saying hello from South Carolina. Hey, girl, welcome. Good to have you, top community member there. Welcome everyone who's watching on Facebook, on, on YouTube, wherever you're watching from. We're so happy to have you. Whatever questions you have for Makita, for Dr. Brotman, get them going in the, in the comments. This is your time to ask her anything. And I'll kick us off with saying, why this guy? Why Brian? Why this story? Yeah, I think it's, it's a really good question because it could, you know, this happens so often. And um, I could have really, you know, chosen any other <laughs> perpetrator of a crime to follow. It it just happened that I I was volunteering at the forensic hospital Perkins where, where Brian remains, and um, so I I was volunteering. I was on sabbatical from my job, and I ran a group called Focus on Fiction, where we um, studied various um, works of literature with a, a small group of patients and. Um, Brian was a member of the group. He was a member of the first group, and I, I carried on doing it for a few years. And you know, different patients would come and go, but Brian was a very enthusiastic, very um, committed, very seemed very intelligent, articulate, um, interested reader. And I didn't really find out very much about the patients other than you know what what ward they were on or how long they've been there. And I. Um, one day after a young girl had left the group, we were talking. I was talking to Brian about how much we missed her, and Brian uh, said, found out that she'd been born in 19, I can't remember where it was, maybe 97. And I said, Well, where were you in 1997? And he said, Well, I was still here. And in fact, I was closer to being released than I am today. And I, I, I realized that meant he'd been in the hospital for more than 20 years. And I found it kind of baffling because he seemed you know, so com compared to many of the other patients, so smart and so sane and so reasonable and so intelligent. And, and so um, I, I asked him what his crime was and he told me that he killed his parents, which again is not particularly unusual in a, a psychiatric hospital like that where many of the patients or parents get schizophrenics who've committed serious crimes. And so I decided I wanted to, you know, to know his whole story. And it was really only after getting to know him quite well that I decided that this was this is something that I'd like to write about and because it seems like there's so much more to the story than than most true crime allows for. Wow. Um, so first of all, I just want to start with the fact that you're teaching fiction in a psychiatric hospital for just for prisoners, right? Is that correct? Yeah, or although they're not theoretically prisoners, they're, okay. they're patients because they haven't been found guilty of any crime. Okay. Okay. But, but, but they have committed a crime. Yes. They have. Yes. Okay. So everyone there has committed some crime. Um, I'm, I was fascinated to hear you say that actually um, the, the murder of one's parents is very common for schizophrenics. I did not know that. I'm learning a lot already. It's, it's um, when, among schizophrenics who commit serious crimes. I mean, most schizophrenics okay. are, you know, Great. as harmless as anyone else. <laughs> yes. 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 Thank you for that clarification. Good point. Um, okay. So, uh, so you're in this psychiatric hospital, you're teaching a fiction class to the residents who all of whom have committed crimes, but have been found um, not liable due to their oh. mental illness. Right. Right. Um, what was the vibe of walking into that hospital? Did you, does it feel sad? Does it feel depressing? Does it feel terrifying? Do you feel unsafe? I mean, what's it like to walk into a place that most of us have never been surrounded by people who have all done something violent? Well, the, it, it, it really doesn't feel like a hospital at all because hospitals are, you know, places where people come and go and there's a lot of bustle and noise and activity and mm. you know, smells of disinfectant and people, <laughs> uh, people moving around and it's very quiet and there's a lot of security. There's huge barbed wire fences. So in that sense, it looks exactly like a prison um, because there's so much security and there's 
you know, metal detectors and security guards on the way in. And so in, in that respect, it's very different from a hospital. Um, you know, you get your bags searched and um, and then once you're inside, it's very, it seems very quiet. And so I think places like Perkins used to be called asylums. And I think asylum might be a better word for it, only that's kind of fallen out of use now. We tend to, we tend not to use that word, but the average stay, I think is around seven years. So it's not a place where people go to, you know, to immediately get well. There's a lot of bureaucracy involved. And then at Perkins, the, the hospital where Brian is, there's three different levels. There's maximum, medium, and minimum, depending on, and patients uh, have different privilege levels, depending on the amount of time they've been there, the seriousness of the crime, the medication they're on, the diagnosis. And um, in maximum level, there's the, the wards are kept locked and the patient's rooms are kept locked. Uh, in medium, they're allowed to leave their rooms at certain times and the wards are kept locked for a certain amount of time. And then in minimum security, the patients are allowed to come and go pretty much um, freely because, I mean, the idea is that these, these patients will eventually return to the community or at least will transfer to, you know, some, um, some kind of facility where they're able to um, work and re regain lives in the ordinary lives in the community like everyone else. And so mm. the idea is, is this kind of gradual transition to back to normal life. And, um, and it's actually kind of difficult for someone to be kept there that long, which is, again, another thing that makes it so baffling why Brian was, was there for so long, because it's actually quite a high threshold for, for people to be kept there. Mm, okay. Wow. So, Mikita, you have a PhD. You are an Oxford educated scholar and psychoanalyst, um, as well as the author of several previous books, including An Unexplained Death, The Great Grisby, and The Maximum Security Book Club. Um, you're a professor of humanities at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. Why this fascination with um, people who commit crimes? You know, I don't want to say I mean, is it killers? I mean, what's the term here? Um, well, in this case, I guess, uh, I guess you know, the mentally ill. But okay, but and but but you could be working with people who are just struggling in their daily life to get right. to work, or struggle with parenthood, or struggle just with their marriage, or whatever. Why? Why this work? What drew you to this I think work? It's the same for the same reason that. I wanted to tell a different kind of true crime story or a, a true mm -hmm. crime story that starts in a different place because um, I feel that that most true crime is about victims and yes. and quite rightly it should be so. But I also think that there are a lot of people who commit crimes who are victims themselves. Mm -hmm. and it's just a question of like, at what point do you tell the story? Do you tell the story like when they're a child and they're being victimized in, in that if you were telling that story then they would be the focus and all sympathies would be with them hmm. at a later date those victims become perpetrators on their own and and then they become you know the the not the focus the the, the predator or the perpetrator hmm. but i think it's not you know it's just not like a so black and white hmm. um, i think that people occupy both roles and and sometimes you can occupy both roles at the same time and most uh, true crime writing doesn't kind of allow for that gray gray area and so that's i guess that's why i'm interested in in people who've committed crimes because in a way i feel like there's inappropriate stigma towards them um i feel that in some ways uh any one of us could be in that position um Many of these are people who, um, who, you know, haven't had the kind of advantages that, that we've had in terms of education and upbringing and mm. um, loving and, and so forth. But I also think that, um, you know, we think of murderers and not murderers, but really it only takes a moment to commit a murder. Um, and before that, the perpetrator is just like anyone else. So that's what I'm kind of interested in is that, mm. um, the why we need to create this huge distinction between us and them and why all our sympathies tend to go in, in one direction and not the other. And um, 
and why we kind of need to like create these defenses against um, identifying with people who've done terrible things. Mm, interesting. This is very meaty conversation here, very complex, very thought provoking, because I think a fundamental uh, coping mechanism for all of us is this us and them thinking, not just when it comes to people who have done violent things, but all over, right? Politically, ideologically, religiously, there's this us and them thinking can lead to some really bad outcomes. Um, and, and dropping down those walls feels scary and feels hard. The idea that we're all capable of something like this. Um, let me ask you in your, cause you say that you work, I mean, you were met Brian while teaching this class, but you worked with him extensively to create this book. He let you access his court records, his medical records. You mm -hmm. met with him many times, you interviewed him. So you, you spent a lot of time in Brian's presence. Um, in that relationship and work, did you ever feel unsafe? Do you consider this person a friend? Uh, yeah, I consider him a friend. and. I never felt unsafe. I mean, as I said right from the very beginning, Brian seemed, apart from the fact that he's, you know, been in hospital for so long, he seemed no different than anyone else I know, and certainly never gave any signs of instability or paranoia or dangerousness. Or I mean, he's unhappy and he's um, uh, he's he's very guarded and defended. But I think a lot of that is from being in the hospital for so long, rather mm. than any kind of. Uh, mental illness but um but it's the same with many of the patients as well i mean because most of them are pretty heavily medicated it's it's difficult to you know a lot of the symptoms are um sort of tamped down and um mm. so so no one is really kind of dangerous or, or symptomatic although crimes mm. do occur in, in the hospital all the time but um but no i never felt like i i found brian sort of interesting and informative and full of insight and a very kind of like rich um gateway into this this life that most people don't know about or don't think about or don't read about and and full of kind of interesting information and also you know he's funny and um genial and um there's, there's things that he kept to himself that i don't know about him um that we didn't talk about but I never felt that he was um, threatening or dangerous or anything like that. Mm. Um, the one one thing that's interesting is that, like the you know the books getting a lot of publicity and attention, and I, I've told Brian about it and I've shown him the book, but he's really not that interested. I mean, he, because it, it's it means nothing to him. You know, his life there is like he's never been on the internet. He kind <laughs> of knows what it is, but. I mean, 27 years ago is a really long time. Right. So these, like his life is kind of circumscribed to to this hospital. And so mm. if I tell him like, you know, the books in the New York Times or, you know, like I'm doing all these podcasts, it's, it's I mean, like what, what means, what's meaningful to him is like, can he get coffee or, you know, these mm -hmm. things make a real difference in his day-to-day -day life and experiences where things outside the hospital are just, you know, it's like saying to him, uh, you're famous on Mars, or, you know, ah. like meaningless kind of. Right, right. Well, speaking of the New York Times, the New York Times picked your book as a summer 2020, 2021 reading pick. Congratulations. Huge, huge accolade there and not the only one. The Library Journal raves Brotman deftly points to problems at facilities like Perkins from psychi uh, psychiatrists who spend too little time with patients to high staff turnover. This thought provoking book adds to conversations. Um, I mean, this like, this must be extremely meaningful to you to to be to get this kind of validation and um, and praise. Yeah, it's 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 very nice. It's the thing is, I like I it it, it was like at least a year from turning in the manuscript to the book coming out. So it's a it's a while since I've thought about it. Mm. Like you know, I've been working on other things, and but it's really nice to to see. The book getting attention because I'm not really the point is not really to so much to draw attention to people in Brian's position but mm. to actually help people to think about maybe get them thinking about you know if you if you're a true crime lover 
or even a crime fiction lover, mm -hmm. like to think a little bit more about the artifice of those constructions, like um, what's been set up here when we read the story, is there a villain and a perpetrator and who are we meant to sympathize with and why and how does that like play into this kind of perpetual dynamic of us versus them because that's also how fiction works you know you identify and sympathize with one the, with the protagonist or the narrator and um and and of course you know you can't really have all characters be sympathetic but in a way like reading fiction is kind of like a kind of microcosm or a little slice of how we empathize in general we we can't empathize with everybody and so we mm. generally tend to empathize with people who we feel are most like us um, mm. whether it's color or race or gender or you know um what a person has done and that's why it's hard to to get um like inmate accounts of or perpetrator accounts of crimes because it's very hard for someone who's committed a crime to come across as sympathetic and yet in brian's case for example he has committed a terrible crime but he was also mm. found not criminal responsible so um uh, so there's a kind of dilemma there like how should you think about someone who has done something terrible and yet at the same time we're also saying that this was um, a consequence of a mental disease that that caused him to do something and you wouldn't blame someone who had alzheimer's or something if they committed a, a crime when they were out of their mind or um mm. so, but we tend to we still tend to kind of blame um the mentally ill for the crimes that they they commit even if they're not l legally responsible mm. Mm. thought-provoking points you are raising here Mikita. thank you for that um i just want to open it up we have five minutes left uh, with Makita. So if anyone has any questions for her about her writing process, about her work, about her um, research for this, about her relationship with Brian, her friendship with Brian, anything, get those questions going in the comments. Um, Makita, what do you want people to walk away from this book learning or thinking? Is it is it to start to question the artifice, as you said, of true crime narratives? Is it to create more empathy for those who are suffering with mental illness? What are, what is your, what are you, what do you want think, us to leave with? I think it's, it's those things, definitely, the things that you describe. Um, and, but, you know, even in like constructing my own book, I have to construct this narrative where, you know, it, it has to be made dramatic and Brian is the protagonist. Mm -hmm. And when in fact, um, a lot of his daily life is bureaucracy and you know 27 years in a hospital is a long time mm. and i have to make these kind of this dramatic arc so even in a book that kind of purports to be showing the areas that other books don't show you know i still have to kind of make it artificial to a certain degree so but yes mm. i mean i'd like people to think about like in in a in reading crime fiction or true crime at what point does this narrative take place and what how would my sympathies be different if i if i learned if i was shown the the perpetrator as a child for example mm. or their personal history and i didn't know anything about the victim just mm. how just to think more about like how um what victimhood is and like where it comes from and how how that construct has like come to mean something very particular mm. Uh, Makita, have you ever watched a show on Netflix called Dirty John? Yes, yeah. Are you watching the season's uh, Betty? No, but I, I listened to Dirty John podcast and I really liked it. And then I watched the Dirty John Netflix. But this is based on the Betty Broderick case, I think. I'm not yes. watching it, but I know the case really well and have a, a great deal of sympathy with, with Betty Broderick. Um, are they recommending it? So I have been watching it. I was completely sucked into season one. My sister and I binge watched it last Christmas. I mean, in two days, we just we just couldn't stop watching. And I have been watching the season two, Betty. In and I'm rationing myself. I only let myself watch it while I'm doing the elliptical, and I and I save it because I I think to myself, otherwise I'm not going to do the elliptical. <laughs> so I'm like, I, if I if I save it, I'll make myself exercise. Um, but it's really interesting because. 
it, it is, I think what I, what I love about the podcast and what I love about the show is that they try to do, I think, a pretty unbiased job of showing the different characters, of showing Betty, of showing Dan, of showing his mistress, Linda. And you do feel sympathy. And I feel myself being like, oh, come on, Betty. But then I'm like, oh, but, but Linda, oh, but Dan. And it's so fascinating to feel these shifting senses of allegiances, these shifting senses of loyalty and protection. Um, and also seeing her act in a way that's not, I mean, I don't want to use the term crazy, but not mentally healthy, right? Um, but she's still serving that sentence in yeah. California. What are your what thoughts are, about the case? Well, I, re I recommend that you go to you go to courttv.com and there's a whole archive of great court cases mm. like, you know, the Menendez brothers and, and Dharma and, and the, um, and the, the original Betty Broderick case, you can watch, you can watch it. And it's just really compelling. I mean, she's a very, very sympathetic character, you know, and you can kind of see how someone could be driven, you know, to the to the end of their tether. I mean, that's a really good example of how, you know, it, it sort of could be any one of us that everything that she's gone through and then being put in this dreadful, embarrassing position, that it's kind of like a, a, a beaten dog lashing out. And I think it's, it's a it's more interesting than the, the fictional version anyway. So I really recommend that there's some great trials archives you can watch. I'm kind of addicted. Yeah. I mean, on the other hand, and thank you for that. I will, I will be checking that out right after we get off of here. Um, but, you know, something that I'm struggling with is, I mean, if we are, and I'm trying to wrestle my way through this, so please help me. If we're endlessly compassionate to the perpetrator, to the killers, how do we balance that with also compassion and seeking justice for the victims? I mean, we can't just be like, oh, he had a bad childhood. Too bad he mowed down 10 people and ended and oops, right, right. and did their lives you know how do we how do we balance this well i think i think you have to uh, do that everyone has to do that for themselves and i think of course there's a there's a line to empathy empathy can't be all embracing or we we simply wouldn't be able to to exist if we felt sympathy for every if we we have to treat certain people we have to create a them for ourselves but all i'm saying is that the the them we create for ourselves doesn't have to be the them that the justice system or that someone else gives mm. us that we think for ourselves like is this person worthy of compassion or am i just being given a script you know i'm just being told given a message that i'm supposed to agree with and to think you know think for yourself about uh, about the the person's origins and circumstances and um and how how you'd feel if the story were being told at a different point in time Mm. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, and thank you for letting us know about the Court TV archives. Good to know what you're watching. Christina would like to know, what do you enjoy reading? We know what you like to watch, but what do you like to read, Makita? I um, read everything, um, anything, anything that I, lots of fiction, lots of nonfiction, fiction, 19th century fiction, modern fiction. I mean, the only things I don't read very much of are science and um <laughs> science fiction and, you know, books about war. <laughs> I, I, I'm reading, currently I'm reading a, a book by Nancy Jo Sales that's an um, expose of her life in, in data. It, it's about dating apps and um, the inferno of horror that they produce. Um, and I saw the book reviewed in the New York Times and it looked really interesting. And so I tend to read like whatever grabs me Wow, I love that. Thank you for that answer. I'm sorry my dog was barking so much. Right. Here, I have in the other room. <laughs> my downstairs neighbors have dared to leave the building, so that is not okay by Pelu, the vicious 14-pound dog, a guarding guard dog. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, well co-host on the show. I, she sometimes is my co-host and I, I would love it if I could just sort of, I have a little stool for her to prop, pop up on <laughs> her little, her, her eager little ears would be up. Oh my gosh. Well, Makita, this has been a, a fascinating, illuminating, and eye-opening, heart-opening, mind-opening uh, conversation. 
thank you so much for um, for for these insights, for this rare glimpse into um, what happens next um, after you know a true crime case is solved. Um, for taking us into worlds that we could never um, get into ourselves, both literally and metaphorically, um, on the pages of this book. Congratulations on all of the incredible praise that your book has earned. Um, it, it it is it's it is so deserved and and we love seeing you seeing this anisa is saying thank you so much for a great chat anisa thank you as always uh for joining us thank you to everyone who's joining us and um and you can continue the conversation on social media follow, be sure to follow makita on twitter and instagram and uh and makita thank you so much congratulations you, um, and happy pub day thanks okay have a great day I'm sorry I was late at the beginning. Not at all. 